Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Allen Avenue Unitarian Universalist Church's in-person and online worship. 
Whether today is your first time here or you've been coming for years, we're so glad that you're with us. My name is Erica Bartlett, my pronouns are she and hers, and I'm the chair of the worship committee. We are growing a community that transforms lives through the power of love. Our mission calls us to celebrate diversity, encourage spiritual growth, and promote social responsibility while we travel on and care for the earth. Welcome to those at home who are joining us on Zoom. If you're attending for the first time, please go to our website and fill out the welcome card so we can know more about you. This morning's service about appreciating the other is presented by Allen Avenue's worship committee. Lay-led worship is a tradition at this and many other Unitarian Universalist societies. Here at Allen Avenue, the worship committee either sponsors or presents one such service a month. And on most other Sundays, services are led by our minister, Reverend Tara Humphreys. And now I invite Terry forward for a short announcement. You actually get two of us. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, we are your Holiday Artisan Fairs team. And but you are also. And you are the team. And our, also our team includes Emily O'Neill and Anna Benoit. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being part of our team. Um, we just want to make our very first announcement after the e-blast that yes, we are on, we're excited. This is for fun. We need some fun in this community. With our fundraiser. With our fundraiser, <laughs> exactly. And we are looking for people who are artisans of any kind. If you make jams and jellies and gorgeous cakes and pies, or if you make wonderful poetry or photography or music or anything, crafts and fiber arts, lots of knitters and quilters and crocheters, and woodworkers and pottery makers and you name it. If you think other people would like it, we want you. So please contact us. You can have your own whole table because you have so much fabulous stuff to sell. Or if you don't have so much stuff, you can combine with others at a general kind of a table like fiber arts or fine foods or other things like that, crafts. And we are looking for a few people to help, to help organize those specific areas. We're also gonna look for helpers for collecting money. Thank you, Barbara Freeman. <laughs> for um, tables, we're gonna need tables. If you have tables at home, we're gonna need to borrow them because we don't have enough in the building. We're gonna need setup and clean up and spell people so they can take a break and you name it, we're gonna need it. So. We also are looking for a few musicians who would like to play for a short period of time during our sales mm -hmm. so that makes it more festival. Exactly. And jovial. And decorators. And decorators. If you love to decorate. So no matter who you are, what you do, we have a place for you. Please see us, call us, email us. And what is it is December 3rd, the first Saturday in December, the weekend after Thanksgiving weekend. And then we have it done, we have a great time, and we can enjoy the rest of the holiday season. Eight weeks away. <laughs> and counting. Thank you. Thank you, Terry and Celeste. <clears throat> uh, for those who are here in the sanctuary this morning, we invite you to take this opportunity to silence your cell phones so that you can be fully present. We're so glad that all of you have joined us. After the service, please join us for coffee and conversation. Those on Zoom can remain on the call for community and conversation. And now, let us center our hearts and minds with the ringing of the bell.
A single fiber can hold but a bit. When joined and spun, it becomes a thread. The weaver puts threads together to form fabric and cloth to co cover us. Eyes look to cloth and the dyes give color and form. <laughs> Think of all the different threads hanging on the wall behind me. The warp and weft builds the fabric into strength. Identifying with others instead of comparing ourselves to them can reveal our common humanity and help us see the connections that are already there. The warp and weft of the threads work together. These threads build our community and give us common ground. It takes the opposing directions to make the fabric. It is all those others, and I the other, that make a rich community. These quilts were made with caring hands, hands that work together in creativity. Our communities are like this, and the contrast in our communities, the opposing ideas, give contrast and patterns and form to both our communities, our quilt, and our lives. And now we'll light the chalice. We light this chalice to find inner peace for love for each other and faith in ourselves. Also, to be welcoming to whomever we meet and, to, and kind to all living creatures. So gather around this light of hope as we share our time together. And now we join in singing our opening hymn, Building Bridges, number 1023 in the Teal Hymnal. Please remain seated. We can sing this through one time, and then we're going to do it as a round. But I'll give you a little more info after we've done it once, okay? Thank you. 
I really like the, the number ones. I'll see you all on Thursday night. <laughs> My name is Erica Bartlett, and I had a recent experience with a bird, not a penguin, a different bird, uh, that did get me thinking about the, what, those I might consider other. A few weeks ago, I walked out of the CVS on Congress Street and stopped after a couple of steps when I spotted a small bird, I think some kind of sparrow, sitting directly in the middle of the sidewalk. It hadn't been there when I went into the store, and I assumed it had hit a window and gotten stunned. The good news was the bird seemed fairly alert, but I didn't really feel comfortable leaving it there. Then another woman came out of CVS and a man walking a bike came down the sidewalk. They both saw me looking at the bird and stopped to see what they could do. We agreed that it could be dangerous to leave the bird where it was, since others might not spot it in time. So we decided to see if we could get the bird closer to the entrance of David's bridle, which is set back from the sidewalk. The man with the bike reached down to shoo the bird in the direction we wanted, and to our relief, the bird just got up and flew away. I figured if it could do that, it hadn't been that badly injured, and I was glad to see it out of harm's way. As I left to go about my day, it occurred to me that I knew absolutely nothing about the other two people except that they were also concerned about the welfare of this little bird. I didn't know what they did for work or if they had jobs. I had no idea what religion, if any, they were or their political beliefs or marital status. They could have been quite opposite to me on one or more of those counts. Someone I might in different circumstances have put in the other category and avoided as such. But on that morning, none of that mattered. Regardless of anything else, I felt momentarily connected to those two people by our shared goal of helping the bird. It got me thinking that this is a good way to appreciate those I think of as other, to find some common ground. It doesn't have to be wanting to help birds, though I'll always appreciate it when people care about animals. It might be trading cookie recipes, talking about favorite books, admiring a sunset, or laughing at the same spots in a TV show or a movie. Finding that common ground is important for another reason, too. It helps remind me to appreciate everyone's humanity and humanness. It's so easy to think of other people as a group of characteristics or beliefs and to dismiss them if I don't like those characteristics or beliefs. But finding any commonality reminds me that while we have many differences, in so many ways, we're the same. Wanting a safe place to live, to be treated fairly and with dignity, to have enough to eat, and even better, to have it be food we enjoy, to be loved. Remembering this helps me relate to others. On those fundamental levels, we're so very much the same, and sometimes we'll be similar in the details too, like caring about birds who pat a fall. Knowing that allows me to feel empathy and compassion for those I don't have other things in common with and find connections I might otherwise have missed. Good morning, I'm Anna Noyes Benoit. Um, this piece is called Why Diversity and it's written by Anonymous. <laughs> Frequently I'm asked, why should the UUA spend money, time, and resources on racial and cultural diversity? I sometimes feel burdened with this expectation 
that I should have an answer because I'm a psychologist by profession and I happen to be an African American. Often the person asking the question goes on to point out that not many African Americans would be interested in Unitarian Universalism, that African Americans and other minorities have a theology that is too different from UUism, or that we will never get large numbers <clears throat> of them to come. Once, someone even invited me to leave and go back to wherever, whatever church I came from if it was so bad at the UUA. The reason I want cultural and racial diversity in the UUA extends beyond issues of numbers, theology, or money. It has to do with the fact that it is the right thing to do. The religious challenge for all of for our times moves us to open our doors to all and to promote wholeness in the midst of diversity. Many people seem to want racial and cultural diversity up to a point, but I believe true inclusivity moves the point. Learning how to develop, value, and appreciate cross-cultural relationships is to everyone's benefit. To embrace a world where there is no cultural diversity, Euro-Americans, Native Americans, African Americans, Hispanics, Mexican Americans, Asian Americans, people of all sexual orientations and all ages, people dealing with physical and emotional limitations, women and men must be willing to examine themselves and reach out to the community. When everyone comes to the table for discussion, there will be differences of opinion, and yet we can ignore no one. All bring gifts to be shared. All can be honored and enriched. To build a racial, racially and culturally diverse community is to build a world of beauty and power. It is the right thing to do. Being able to honestly and lovingly share gifts pains and appreciations with each other is what religion is truly about. A blessing awaits us all and we will come and it will come when we experience the richness of racial and cultural diversity.
Good morning. I'm Rick Kimball. And the other day, as I began reflecting on this reflection, another reflection bounced back at me, and I found that I was staring at a mirror. A distorted version of me stared back, and for a moment, I was speechless. Imagine that. <laughs> but then words that were different from each other in some ways, and the same as each other in some other ways, began floating around in my mind. And this is what resulted. That day, as I looked in the mirror and froze with startled stare, what I saw, you see, was not quite me. Somebody else was there. I thought that physics had failed me and asked how science could dare to come up with another's face that I would seem to wear. But then the mirror's sober voice said, it's well that you despair from showing you the look of you of which others are aware. They don't see you the way you do. They see you as a scare who sees them as menacing other, so how they act is fair. They look at you as otherness, a view of them you share, and so you to a distance stay a tense and fearing pair. You each cannot the other know till both can finally dare to discard your self-righteous thoughts and trade deep selfless care. Accept each other's oddities as you yourselves compare and close embrace diversity, an action dumbly rare. As long as both just surface glimpse of each other, you'll be rare. You'll see such superficial stuff and tell true selves you rare. Yes, one day I looked in the mirror and froze with startled stare. What I saw, you see, was just not me. Somebody else was there. Well, that mirror message did for me what mirror messages are made to do. It caused me to reflect. To reflect about connecting with other. We as a world are not good at that these days. We meet each other hoping to see an only slightly altered version of our own selves. And when we see somebody else, we tend toward panic and distrust. We see others as different from and potentially hostile toward us. And others see us as different from and potentially hostile toward them. We attempt to find samenesses to make us feel better, and sometimes we do. But the, what the mirror would have us do is to see each other as we really are, and what we really are is different different from each other. Well, of course, we are in fact other to each other. That's by definition, and it's okay. We speak in this church of wanting more diversity, and that's a great idea that I support, but let's recognize that we are already diverse. We are not clones, we are different, and that's a cause for both acceptance and celebration. It is also proof that we can reach across the gulf and connect when both of us are willing. I was other to my twin sister from birth. She popped out first and immediately spoke up to ask where the other baby was. <laughs> and by the way, a registered nurse once asked if we were identical. <laughs> I said that we were not the last time we took a bath together. We were different, just as the truly identical twins I know are different, and happily so. I am other to my wife, Tyrrell, and she is other to me, even after almost 59 years of marriage. We are different from each other, now more than ever, but we accept that and we treasure it. And I am different from the Floridian, or even the main Republican book burner, the QAnon member, the immigrant hater. Now, there is a larger gap. We are other to each other with other in bold capital letters. 
and we do not celebrate our diversity. It discomforts us. Can we change that? Can we close the gap? Well, I don't know. I do know that we must try, both of us, all of us, really try, or the fires of hatred and burning books, not just could, but will, spread beyond control. The sparks, my friends, are already flying. Now we as a church can help extinguish those sparks, and by strengthening ourselves, we can hope to reach, accept, and strengthen each other. We are a freely gathered, open, and welcoming faith community, supported by our own contributions. Each week, one third of our offering is given to a nonprofit organization whose mission aligns with our Unitarian Universalist principles. This month's Share the Plate recipient is the Maine Unitarian Universalist State Advocacy Network, or MUSIN, a statewide advocacy and public policy network anchored in the Unitarian Universalist faith and animated by its principles and its description is just about as long as its name. <laughs> Musen links our 25 main congregations and many friends in an active legislative ministry. Donations can be made now as the basket is passed through the donate button on our website, a2u2.org, or if you are a member on Breeze. When using Breeze, please note if the donation is your pledge or a gift to our share the plate. You may also mail a check directly to the church. And if you are visiting us for the first time this morning, please know that your presence is your gift to us. At this time, our offering will be collected and gratefully received.
That was some nice miles. Thank you. My name's Mike Luce. The title of my piece is All Those Others. So at first, everyone except mom and dad were others, I'm pretty sure. Might have stayed that way a little longer for most, seeing as I'm an only child, and this was in Caratonk with maybe 300 people total, so, you know. I suppose I didn't really start thinking about anyone as those others much until maybe sometime in high school. And then it was just like seasonal thoughts about those Yarmouth kids, Freeport's big basketball rival. There were a total of two other kids in my age range who had dark skin and might have qualified, I suppose. One was a friend of mine, but I don't recall ever really being conscious of his darker skin at the time. Thinking back, I'm pretty sure he was Indian, the, the nation. Freeport seemed to be its own little halcyon bubble for a time there, at least for me. There have been some distant others, of course, foreigners in foreign lands on the news, a race riot in some far off city, but the first time I really felt that there were some identifiable others in my life was the result of one of those race riots. Our high school band was invited to march in the Cherry Blossom Festival in DC in 68, the year DC burned right outside the hotel we were trapped in. Black people rioting, for most of us, the first black people we had seen right outside. You'd better believe I came back with some troubling thoughts rattling around in my head. It took some time and distance to buffer the effects of that. Time in the army, having black friends helped. When I was identifying and working as a musician, that was my identity and others consisted of everyone who wasn't a musician. The way it showed up in me was how I judged someone's worth. If you had really impressive chops, I'd probably hang out with you almost no matter what. It took some time and if you weren't a musician, you were someone else, an other who could be okay to hang out with. I got over that. After I left music behind as a profession and eventually found my way to my calling in mental health, most of the folks populating my other's pit were political, more or less. Folks I feared in one way or another. It's largely been that way ever since. And I'm not going to stand here and claim that there won't always be those others in my life. All I hope is that they, who they are is dictated by a, at least a reasonable objective fear. Fearing the other seems to be bred into humans for a reason. Sometimes that instinct serves us well, and sometimes it's cancerous. So I'm a little skeptical of trying to throw it out the window completely. I haven't always been very judicious or wise about that myself, but I'm trying to limit my other's population severely. And I'm still trying to understand those others because consider the alternative, not understanding them. I'm a very political person, and that's always been my sort of criterion for othering people. I'm not really that proud to say it, but it's, that's the truth. But that said, um, I'm a longtime member of a recovery group um, based on a, a problem that we all have in the group in common. And in that group, we don't talk about politics because unity is considered essential to our growth and emotional freedom. So from the beginning in that group, I actually didn't know which people were the other. Um, it was suggested that we look for the commonalities with our fellow members and be careful about comparing ourselves to them. It didn't matter if we came out ahead or behind in our own co comparison. The act of, comparis of comparing would create distance between us. So following these guidelines, because I was 
very serious about recovery. That was my top priority. I found that I felt close to every person in the program. I might not like every personality, but I strongly felt the common humanity among us. We spoke a common language and had common goals. I might suspect what someone's politics were, but I honestly didn't want to sully the feeling of working toward an almost sacred common goal by going to that divisive place. Um, ever since my teen years, I've been in the habit of judging people by their politics. It was in my family, pretty much. Um, but in the recovery group, I learned to see people at their most vulnerable and their most relatable in an essential way. I could be them, and they could be me. Of course, eventually Facebook came along, and I became friends with some of those people. And in this highly charged era, I couldn't resist posting political content, and some of them couldn't either. Suddenly, there was a barrier between me and some people I had really cared about. For me, here's the tricky part of all this. I just don't think that always abstaining from talking about politics is constructive. The issues we face today are very serious, and all sentient beings, as well as the planet itself, are in grave danger unless the issues are addressed. So in good conscience, I can't always keep my mouth shut. Um, but I still believe wholeheartedly in the tradition of leaving politics out of my recovery group. But I also think there must be a way for me to keep the focus on identifying with others instead of comparing myself to them in ordinary conversation. There must be a way to get beyond the um, perceived differences Maybe not being afraid to talk about feelings would give us a common point of identification. I'm not sure of the answer, but I am glad I started thinking about it. That's it. Um, please join us now in our closing hymn, number 128 in the gray hymnal, For All That Is Our Life. Please rise in body or spirit. Um.
words are by Amy Zucker Morgenstern. May all our hours be blessed as this one has been by open-hearted sharing, learning from one another, and making beautiful harmonies together. May we greet everyone we encounter with the same acceptance and grateful kinship until we meet again. Blessed be. Please remain seated for our closing music. <laughs>